So nice. We wanted to do a quick impromptu survey of our attendees just to get a kind of an idea of the local community. Curious, would you guys be interested in the DevOps Days Salt Lake City uh, workshop uh, continuing? Or uh, is it, does everybody kind of have interest in continuing to come to these and then also uh, the conference as well? Um, I don't know if the best way, maybe give me a thumbs up or some on the reaction if you are interested in continuing. Go ahead and speak up if you have any commentary to add. Feel free. Are you asking about the, you know, the full blown DevOps days conference that we've had in Salt Lake before or continuing? I think we, we, we kind of want to find out both. Uh, so let's do, give me for the actual full blown conference. Are you interested in attending that? So kind of a quick um, overview on this. Uh, the same team that runs the DevOps Days Meetup is the same team that plans and organizes the DevOps Days SLC Conference. Um, historically, we were, well, we were very much on track to have one in 2020 before 2020 ruined everybody's best laid plans. Um, we started talking again about one back in August, but then things started getting, you know, not so good with the coronavirus um, Delta variant spiking up again. And so we kind of put that in hold and we wanted to kind of reach out and understand from our community, um, our, our, you guys, if you're interested in us going back and, you know, starting to plan a new conference for 2021 or for 2022, um, is it something that is still provides value to our community? Um, or is DevOps just become another uh, another um, ter a res another resume term, and you might or then you already work for a company that has already done the DevOps and you're good with it. Thank you. Well said. So I saw three or four thumbs up there. Um, out of you guys that did respond, would you want to do it in person? only or possibly a hybrid model where we had a, an in-person and an online option. For those of you that don't want to speak, give me a heart for a hybrid option or a ta-da for a in-person only. <laughs> I think the hybrid option would be great. Okay. okay. Yeah, I second the hybrid. Yeah, we, we gave some real thought to do it or pursuing an online only or to doing an online conference um, last year. However, I we, we really had a hard time justifying the value add of a local conference that's online. So, I mean, if you can go to, if you can go to ObservabilityCon for $200, or you can go to DevOps Days Utah, ObservabilityCon may be more interesting to people because either way you're sitting at your desk half working and half paying attention to talks in the background. That makes sense. <laughs> You're saying a local conference that's available online is probably not a good idea. Well, oh, well I wouldn't want to do local only as a member of the DevOps Days board. Um, I think the having, I think the hallway track is definitely the place that I gained the most value out of all of our conferences. The conversations that you have while somebody is giving a lecture, or the conversations that you continue after you just talked about something with with an with one of the speakers. So. Uh, if we do an on, I mean, I wouldn't mind offering the online options also. Uh, we've definitely looked at doing that two years ago where we brought a simulcast out um, a lot of the talks in real time. Just, I, I don't know about everybody else, but I know that when I attend an online conference, I, I, I really don't pay any attention at all. <laughs> you get busy with work and... <laughs> Somebody Never pings me, oh, I'll just take care of that really quick. T seven, you know, seven... Uh, Seven git commits later, and you're like, "Huh, I was listening to something in the background. Why is it on NPR now?" <laughs> For sure. Okay. And then last question around the conferences is, uh, which season would would work out best for everybody? More something in spring or summer, fall or winter? Um, oh, I've got a a child joining me here. Uh, if you just want to drop your answer in the chat, that'd be great. And uh, from there, sorry, one sec.
bribe him with treats. It always works. Okay. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, all right. Well, we are proud to let Randall present, uh, learn some about Kubernetes and, and logging solutions. So uh, I think we're ready. Oh, you know what? We, uh, what was the other announcement? Um, Brett, I'm trying to remember if there was something else. Just uh, if if you have job openings or you're looking for a job, right. you know, you can put it in the chat or contact the organizers. Uh, or I'll put my email address in there too. Because uh, we'd like to help the community that way as well. Perfect. Thank you. I can't access my Slack right now. Cool. All right. Uh, Randall, are you ready to take over? Uh, sure. Why not? Awesome. Okay. All right. Um, can you see my screen now? Yes. 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 All right, cool. Great. Um, so first of all, uh, I, I, my name is Randall Mawinney. I'm one of the organizers of the SLC DevOps Days Conference. I've been doing that for, or aligned with that for about six years now. Um, as we were saying, I'm really sad that we didn't end up having a conference in 2020. We had originally hoped to have one in 2021. Um, that that kind of did not happen. We started seeing that every other major conference started piling them on in October, November, and December. And we decided that people have limited times and limited resources that they're able to attend conferences. And we, we decided to hold off. That is something that we're hoping to continue. Um, we I really enjoyed planning those conferences. I love the camaraderie. I love interacting with the different community members. And I love meeting all the different speakers. Um, but I also want to make sure that it is something that does continue to add value for, for everybody in our community. So um, any feedback that you guys have on that, I, I really greatly appreciate. So a little bit more about me. Um, I've been working in the DevOps itself space for about six years now, maybe seven years. Um, currently, I am the director of the SRE practice at Bentley Systems. Uh, Bentley Systems does is a very large competitor to AutoCAD. Um, they do a lot of the planning for building out buildings, skyscrapers, bridges, freeways. They've got some really cool technology that rely on drone to make exact copies of existing buildings. So it'll program out the drones, fly them all around a building, captured from every angle, import it directly into a CAD-based program. Some other interesting things like that. Um, I'm highly enjoying this position. It's really taught me a lot in that in this place. Um, prior to that, I was the manager of platform engineering at Dell Technologies. Uh, we were running a, in running one of their public clouds. Um, that was, a, again, a fantastic opportunity. I enjoyed working with Clayton Collum at Dell Technologies there. Uh, and then prior to that, I was a senior DevOps or SRE slash DevOps engineer at, at the EMC prior to that Dell merger. Um, and additionally, I am hiring. Uh, I got two new headcount approved this morning. We are 100% remote. Um, team um, looking for for anybody that would love to they love come join me um, yeah so uh, this specific talk that I'm going to give today um, is was originally designed out to be a workshop but um, workshops I've had mixed luck giving them in an online environment um, I, I've tried a couple of different ways in the past, and really it's easier if I have a couple of people that can go around and help people out in the room, things like that. So I'm going to try to make it as interactive as I possibly can here. Um, I do have a number of different uh, or different tools I'm going to be using on the command line um, to actually stand up all the things that I am talking about. So it's not just, you know, pretty pictures on a PowerPoint shell. Um, I do like interruptions. I like going on tangents. If there's something that I did not explain well, if there's something you want to deep dive in, if there's something that you think that I'm saying that's you know wrong, definitely tell me and we can go off on a tangent and talk about that in, in depth. Um, I want to make sure that what we or that if we're doing a talk that we make sure that it is relevant to everybody else. So yeah. Um, questions, comments, or concerns so far? Okay, so um, a year and a half ago, I was brought into Bentley Systems, and I would, and we are. I've been tasked with 
taking a whole lot of very, very legacy applications running on Windows um, using Microsoft SQL back or as its back end and converting them into containers and getting them into a cloud, into a cloud production environment. Um, the legacy infrastructure did not have any configuration management in place. It had an awful lot of its own challenges. They were manually installing something to send logs out to uh, solar winds, and logs were typically available one day after they were generated, and which means that they couldn't be used for active monitoring. They could not be used to determine the health of a system. And really, if they're a day old, they were almost of no use to anybody. So one of our, so one of our very first goals that we came up with is that we needed to implement a real-time logging solution. We wanted to have something that is vendor neutral. Although Bentley Systems runs extensively in Azure, um, we also are targeting the Chinese market and we want to make sure that we can also run on Alibaba Cloud. We also want to make sure that if Azure, that if Microsoft changes policies that we don't like, we have the ability to turn around and walk away from them without incurring major, without you know having to rewrite major pieces of our stack. We wanted to use something as open source. Um, I'll go over a couple of the reasons why on that in a little bit, but in my personal preference, I would much rather hire a dedicated or hire an intelligent, competent DevOps or SRE than to pay money for somebody to run something for me as a service. Um, there, there's a couple of ex couple of times when that may not be the best case, but in general, I, I like to use open source. I like to contribute back to the open source community, and I like to hire smart people to help me do, make it do exactly what I like it to do. We wanted to have something that was well known and well documented. We wanted we didn't want to go out there and choose a project or chose some open source GitHub project that's been sitting there for six months. It's got pull requests that haven't been touched in three months. Um, we wanted to have something that is, you know, has a very active community and rece receiving active updates. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Um, I wanted to have something that can support all or several different layers of the observability stack. I wanted to have something that can support, you know, real time logs aggregated to a central source something that can tell me, or something that can give me the metrics of how much and telemetry data of how everything that I have is deployed is doing. And something that can, you know, read open or open tracing data, such as Jaeger, Zipkin, et cetera, APM. And I wanted to make sure that when we have all of this data and it's sitting inside of some type of data storage location, that we have a way to meaningfully present that data out not only internally, but sanitized and presented externally so that our customers could see in real time the status of their, of, of their, of their stack. So they can see if there um, is any issues within their stack in real time and know, know right away. And I wanted to and make a sure customer, that- A customer is your partner teams within Bentley or external customers? Oh, that was external customers and internal customers both. Sorry, I should have been more clear. That's cool. Internal customers did not need to have it sanitized. External customers did require sanitization. Um, we, yeah. And I wanted to make sure that we are able to, you know, generate real-time alerts off of any, any piece of data, whether it be a log entry that says your database has crashed, here's the log, or here's your Java core, or you have a CPU that's been sitting at 100%, et cetera. I wanted to be able to receive those alerts and notify my engineers to get engaged immediately. Um, so those were my key requirements when I started this project out. Um, we looked at using a couple of different tools for this. Um, the very first decision we had to make is if we were going to roll our own stack or we were going to use um, something like CloudWatch or App Insights, uh, logging as a service or um, observability as a service solution. Uh, there were some really good things to like about CloudWatch and App Insights. It really is an easy button. Um, if you have a properly configured container that is properly shipping its logs to standard out and standard air, App Insights and CloudWatch do a fantastic job of making this very readily available with almost no overhead. 
The drawback to that is that Microsoft does charge a premium for App Insights. Um, when we had initially turned it on, 20% of my, of my cluster cost was going into App Insights. Uh, additionally, they are largely built around the same open stack, or sorry, same open source infrastructure that you could implement on your own. Um, I don't know how much you how much you guys spend or how much time you guys spend watching this environment. Um, several months ago, Elasticsearch changed its entire licensing model as a direct result of the fact that certain cloud providers use their exact stack as for free or charge money for people to use their exact open source stack and provide a lot of the Elasticsearch tooling out to people for free um, when it was never really designed. It was not properly, you know, giving Elasticsearch back its money. So we'll talk a little bit more about um, the open or about Elasticsearch and open source in a minute because they're not quite open source anymore, which did violate one of my rules. Unfortunately, that happened after I'd built out most of my stack. Um, the competitive, the op, the alternative was implementing a DIY solution. And there are a lot of very good solutions out there. And I'll kind of go over some of the choices that I made when I was building out, building out the platform that I built out. Um, you do have you know, a much finer level of control. If you control every piece of the stack, you can really decide what is important. Um, and you can decide a lot of the things around that as well. It is slightly more complex to deploy um, with it is not quite an easy button. It is not just a checkbox on your deployment screen or a true statement on your JSON file when you build out your clusters. But it is also able to be ported around different Kubernetes providers with minimal changes. Um, obviously, you'll need to look at a couple of things when you're porting it. Uh, Azure Files is very much a Microsoft Azure thing that you would have to find the equivalent of if you were looking at Alibaba Cloud or Amazon or any of the others. So this was some of my very first decisions that we had to make. Uh, we ended up deciding to go down the DIY route. Um, I gave you a couple of the reasons why, largely because we wanted to be able to, you know, port it between different clouds without any complexity to it was the single biggest driver on that. And additionally, like I said, I'd much rather hire smart people than give my money to Microsoft. <laughs> okay. So uh, when we start talking about containers, um, there are there's really two flavors of containers that are out there in the wild. Uh, there's the ones that are incredibly easy to work with, ones that are considered cloud native um, or container native that do follow the you know the the twelve factor app best practices. Um, the single biggest one that we're going to care about in our case is the fact that logs are generated and sent to as event streams to standard air and standard out. When they are shipped out to standard air and standard out, what or the op, the container runtime will pick them up and lay them down as a file inside of your Kubernetes host, um, which which is important for when you start you know wanting to actually extract out those logs. Um, this is the easy one to work with. Um, I was not entirely so lucky to deal with this. As I said, my charter was to take a number of legacy apps and make them work. Uh, with that workflow, um, you will have container logs and your container metrics that will be picked up by your Kubernetes host. And you will need to have some type of agent that will forward them into your time series database. And that is the wrong graphic for this slide. This one is actually slight, or is the wrong one. Anyway. Um, Unfortunately, in my case, I was dealing with a large number of legacy applications that were never designed to be container native. Um, and that chart created some of its own challenges. Um, in order for a lot of the logging stack that we ended up selecting to work, we needed to have something that would ship all those logs to your container standard error and standard out logs. Uh, if you're playing with Linux, there's quite a few different tools to do this. The one that we ended up looking at was was using a FluentD sidecar model. Um, basically, you stand up a inside of your Kubernetes pod, you will stand up a FluentD container that has volume mounts that match all the logging directories for where you want to pick up your logs from. Um, 
you, that can also include your VARPREC file system if you wanted to ship all of VARPREC. But for Windows, that was again in its own unique challenge, uh, dealing with a large number of Windows Kubernetes or Windows pods. Um, things like the Windows event log do not lend themselves very clearly or cleanly to being shipped off to a central logging repository from containers. Uh, Windows did release a tool called Log Monitor, part of the Windows Container Tools. Um, it is a, and it will tail out your Windows event log. It'll also allow you to parse in wherever you want to pass in specific logs from and pass them to standard out. And this was set up so that you could run it just as an init script inside of your container. And that that's um, just an extra step that you have to do when you're dealing with, with Windows or with legacy applications in Windows. Um, I, I hope none of you ever have to deal with that. It's been a really unique challenge. Okay. Uh, and then here is that, or here is the one with the correct graphic, like, a, or this one will actually ship out the logs from the container to an a, to from a Linux container into Fluent D sidecar, which will then ship it into your container or into your pod logs, which will be picked up by your daemon set and shipped into Elasticsearch. So I kind of talked a little bit about the about um, getting logs from stand or from all of your containers and how they are all being shipped into standard air and standard out. What happens from this point is that your container runtime inside of your Kubernetes host will be storing these in a log directory. Um, I think for both Linux and Windows, it is literally var log container, and it'll create out a container-based log for everything or for each container running on that Kubernetes host. Unfortunately, when they're here, they're not especially useful. Um, you can tail them from kube control. You can watch them through the dashboard and things like that, but you really can't interact with them. You can't search through them. Um, what you need to do at this point is you need something that'll read these log files and ship them to whatever your logging backend is. There's quite a few different solutions out there that do this. Um, there is FluentD, which was released by Treasure Data. It has been around for quite a long time. It's a very well-known and well-supported entity. Um, I, it's very, very similar to anybody who's used it would be the Splunk Heavy Forwarder. And uh, there's also things like Palmtail released by the Prometheus team, uh, log beats released by the Elasticsearch team and a handful of others that we could probably talk about in more depth if anybody's interested. But really the main important thing is that you have to have some type of service running on your Kubernetes host that knows how to watch these log files and how to ship them to where it needs to go. So, um, That, that those are some of the things that we would or that needed to be considered considered while we were looking to build out this solution. Um, to build out this solution, I ended up selecting to go with a number of different tools. Um, for my time series database, I ended up selecting Elasticsearch. Um, there are quite a few other alternatives out there that work extremely well as well. Uh, I really, really wanted to go with. Um, not, not graphite. Uh, can't remember the name of it now. One second. Influx. Yeah, Influx DB. Um, that that was my that was my preferred go to. Unfortunately, um, uh, the very first disclaimer on their site says, "Do not ever run Influx DB as a container." Uh, I think that half of the people running Influx DB are actually running it as a container. They do release a fully supported version of the container, but that that warning did dissuade, dissuade me from using that one. Um, I ended up choose, selecting Elasticsearch for a couple of reasons. Um, the main reasons are that it is a very robust, high availability time series database. It's um, well adopted in the community. Uh, it builds or it is very easy to search through and find individual logs, metrics, and those types of things. Um, one of its primary use cases is actually as a search agent. So it is absolutely brilliant at finding data. 
Um, it also, you know, actively builds and indexes all of the data that it is receiving and makes it very easy to work with that data. And you're able to set index lifecycle management policies on each individual index. So that say, if you're running in a PCI compliant environment, you can say, I wanna keep my hot indexes for five days, my cold indexes for 30, and I want it snapshot and stored as something that can be recovered for two years after that. It makes all of those things extremely easy to do. Um, there's a couple of other ones out there that are great, that also work fantastic. Uh, the Prometheus Loki database is fantastic. Graphite was a fantastic solution, but it's starting to feel pretty dated and getting a little bit slow, but again, a good solid solution. Um, so. So Randall, would, would you still use Elasticsearch even with their license change? Yes. You did, did it again? Um, so talking a little bit about that, Elasticsearch did have a fully permissive Apache 2 license until I think it was early this year. Um, they decided that you know, they very publicly removed their Apache 2 licensing and created an Elasticsearch license, which does allow me to use it as an open source impl implementation for my use case, but it prevents you people from being able to make money off of it, which is really what they wanted. Um, there's a whole lot of reasons out there. Uh, I think that it was very much targeted towards the Elastic Open Distro um, release, which basically took Elasticsearch's free or paid features and provided them to users for free. And then um, additionally, certain very large cloud providers were building their entire logging stack based upon Elasticsearch and not, and not compensating Elasticsearch in any meaningful way. Uh, I, I did pass the open source or their new Elasticsearch licensing through my legal team, and they said that they saw absolutely no issues with it, but it is something to be concerned about if you are trying to build out a log aggregating business. Okay, so um, I don't want to just speak the entire time. So one of the things that I am going to do is I have downloaded the Elasticsearch Helm chart. Um, I built out a couple of overrides to make this run in our environment. And we're gonna go ahead and just build one inside of a cluster that I have stood up. Um, currently, I have a new cluster that I built earlier this afternoon. Um, I just labeled it as one of my DMZ clusters to make it publicly accessible. Um, this is running a mixed node environment with two Windows nodes and two Linux nodes. It is running Kubernetes 1.2 or 121. Um, with Calico turned on. Um, so that this is the cluster that we're going to be working with for this. And I don't know if anybody's used this this tool before, uh, Canines. I am a huge fan of it for play, or for dealing with Elasticsearch. Um, it gives you a nice graphic or a nice uh, a nice CLI UI to be able to take most of the elast or to take most of your cube control actions and run them here. I actually so, just downloaded it today. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I'm a huge fan of canines. Uh, I was there, just buying that. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, first thing that we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and create a namespace for Elasticsearch. Cube control, create namespace, Elasticsearch. Um, I do have a couple of things already running inside my cluster. I do have my Nginx ingress deployed and I do have cert manager deployed as well. Um, if anybody has questions on those, I can talk to them a little bit, but basically cert manager allows you to issue SSL certificates off of any given ACME provider. Uh, Let's Encrypt is a fantastic example. Um, in my case, I'm only using it to do, or for this demo, I only have a self-signed issuer set up. So we will build out self-signed certificates. Okay, we can see that we do have an Elasticsearch uh, namespace now. There are currently no pods running inside of it. Um, this is the default Elasticsearch Helm chart. I just downloaded it locally. Um, and then I do have a number of overrides. A uh, couple of things that we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and set the cluster name for the Elasticsearch cluster. 
Um, I only have two Linux nodes, so I'm going to build a very small Elasticsearch cluster with two nodes and require one of them to always be on as the master. I am going to force it to run on Linux because this does not run on Windows. And I'm going to go ahead and set the uh, Java, Java heap size and set some resource limits and pass in some super secure passwords for it. So. Can you just, sorry? I just had a quick question about the Helm chart. I went through this just a couple of days ago. Are you doing the operator or? No, this is their community release Helm chart. Can you, I'm unclear on what the difference is. Do you, do you know? So operators in general are a great, or would be fantastic if you have multiple people that want to have very, or have to have their, I can't speak, want to have their own version of something. Um, a great example would be, say, po uh, the Postgres operator. You might have multiple teams that want to be able to implement their own version of Postgres. As a business, you also want to set sane requirements around those Postgreses. So you would use the operator that would allow you to do a, a unique manifest that would request a Postgres cluster to be, or Postgres pod to be created and everything that was captured inside the operator around your company's best practices saying, okay, I know that all of my databases need to have this much memory. I know that they need to have the following types of users enabled, those types of things. You can capture all of that in the operator. And when a new user comes in to request Postgres, they will get a Postgres provision by that operator built to your company's specs. Um, the Elasticsearch operator kind of operates in the same way. You're able to request unique instances of Elasticsearch. Awesome, thank you. Great explanation. So um, that I think is especially useful for people that are playing more with, this, with, the, uh, with the search piece of Elasticsearch than with the people that are playing with the using it as their log aggregate for their entire cluster. Um, if you're running multiple search index or search uh, Elasticsearch search clusters, then you'll want to have multiple ones that stand out. So, yeah, after hearing that, it definitely sounds like that's overkill for what I need, but it seems like most of their documentation is trying to steer people towards using the operator Helm chart. Uh, I think that there are, well, they also have a new release call uh, that from that's the full elastic stack that can that will deploy out um, elastic search log beats met or log beats metric beats and kibana all to, as a packaged entity as well um, if you're looking for one that is quick and easy to implement i would i would suggest looking at that one um, another alternative to that is bitnami has also released something that they call their management suite which installs pretty much my exact same stack Using Fluent or using Fluent, Elasticsearch, Grafana, Cert Manager, it installs all of those off of a single off of a single deployment as well. A uh, um, couple of the other things that I am setting up in here is we're setting up a, a ten gig storage account on each node using Azure File. So uh, the command we're going to use to install this: Helm Helm minus N for namespace Elasticsearch, the namespace we just created. Install. Elasticsearch. Uh, we're going to deploy it from the charts that I downloaded, and we're going to pass in those overrides that I just talked about. Uh, okay. We can see in real time that our pods are coming up. Um, for the case, or for the sake of this demonstration, I have turned off liveness probes. Typically, this will take about 10 to 12 minutes for them to become fully alive and actually report that they are green, but I do not want to spend a ton of time on that. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and just do a port forward really quickly to the Elasticsearch port, and we can go ahead and start querying it immediately. Okay, um, our Elasticsearch cluster is up now. Um, we can see that it is in fact green. This is Elasticsearch's definition of ready. 
um, we can see that it did set up and give the cluster name, the one that we passed in through our through our overrides chart. We can see the current number of um, different indexes that it has on it. And if we do a quick run or do a quick send against it, sorry. We should be able to see a list of our indexes as well. Ah, it's creating new ones now. We can see that it just created the GOIP databases, et cetera. So the Elasticsearch home chart operates on something called the stateful set, um, very similar to deployments. We can talk a little bit more on that if you guys are interested or not, but it's just another deployment model that allows your pods to be um, aware of other pods. Typically a deployment would only be, you know, aware of its own deployment. Um, uh, can I can I see the uh, persistent volume and persistent volume claim of your Helm chart? For sure. So my PVCs, um, these are the ones that it actually stood up for me. They are the two 10 gig ones. Uh, are you looking for something specific about them? I was just wondering how did you create your dynamic PVC in your stateful set? You must be using an ordinal value somewhere, right? Uh, I am. Um, so the default chart is kind of coming in with persistence enabled true. Um, and I did I override that with somewhere? Yeah, persistence is enabled on it. Um, this is being created out. You can see that in your stateful set. Uh, there should also be a. There should be one that will actually create out the stateful or the uh, the volume out as well. Uh, the volume claim templates, here we go. And that is actually part of the Elasticsearch publicly provided out on um, Helm chart for doing this. Gotcha, makes sense, thank you. Yeah. And then you can see that that is backed up by these persistent volumes. Uh, this one was from earlier. I'm surprised it's still there. Delete failed on it. I'll have to clean that up after this call. Okay. So we can see that our two pods are, are in fact running there. Our, our two pods are running there. Our two Elasticsearch masters that they are currently reporting in as green. And we can see that it has gone ahead and created a couple a. Um, I did turn on self-monitoring as well, so it did create out its monitoring index for us as well. Okay. So I talked a little bit earlier about how we are, we now have all of our logs sitting on our Kubernetes hosts and they're being stored just out of our log folder there. Um, if you lose that, if you, lose that node, there's a very good chance that you may lose that Firelog container directory as well, depending on how your cloud provider is set up. Um, some of them are running Kubernetes on top of Kubernetes. I believe that Azure itself is running Kubernetes on top of Hyper-V. So I think that everything will be persisted out. Uh, when I was at Dell, we were running it on top of VMware. And it was kind of interesting watching how it actually handles all these persistent volumes in the background. But, so the next thing that we need though, is we need a way to ship those logs off of our Kubernetes host and into our, into our centralized logging repository, in our case, Elasticsearch. Um, I did talk a little bit earlier that there are a number of different solutions for this. There is the uh, Elasticsearch does provide out a Java-based solution called LogBeats. Um, uh, there's an awful lot to like about LogBeats. Um, it is very easy to implement. It plays very well with Elasticsearch. Uh, Prometheus offers out a tool called Palmtail, which again, fantastic to work with, works fantastically with Loki. Um, I ended up selecting FluentD uh, or TD Agent, depending on which version of it you, you end up pulling. TD Agent itself is, or FluentD is based on Ruby. Um, it does play very, very well on top of both Linux and Windows nodes because, because of how Ruby operates. Um, there is no fundamental changes there. Um, 
It also is a very robust ecosystem and is used extensively both inside of Kubernetes and externally as a, as a log shipper. And there are just tons and tons of different plugins that can do all sorts of different things. In my production clusters, um, I have a number of parsers that I've custom written that know how to read my logs and give and turn all of my you know, individual logs coming off of my legacy applications into a structured data file that you can that makes it very easy and quick to search inside of Elasticsearch. And that is something that um, that Fluentd handles very, very gracefully. I again, the fact that it was very that they already released a Windows version of it is something that made me very excited. So whereas I believe that the Elasticsearch, I would have had to custom build my own images. But, so we'll go ahead and install Fluentd really quickly. We're going to go ahead and first of all create a namespace for Fluentd. And inside of this repository, we can see that we do, or that I did pull down their public charts. Um, I have made extensive modifications to them personally, uh, but uh, I, I'll, I can definitely push out what I've made changes to. Um, basically, I needed to change a couple of things about how it reads from Windows to pick up the logs in the format that I wanted them to. Um, I am going to pass in a number of environment variables, basically telling it where Elasticsearch lives, uh, how to talk to Elasticsearch, what the Elasticsearch index name should be. And it's going to go ahead and tell it that I wanted to, you know, use these configuration files from, for, from them. Uh, one to ship, ship it to Elasticsearch, one to transform all of my data so that it makes everything JSON inside of JSON, uh, one that knows how to talk to Kubernetes, one for containers. It'll also stand up a metrics endpoint and can read from system D. So. Command for this will be helm minus n for namespace, fluent d for daemon, or for that namespace that we just created, fluent d daemon set. We're going to go ahead and run the install command. We're going to go ahead and call it fluent d, and we're going to pass in that, that chart and that override file. We can see that it did, or when we created out the daemon or the namespace, that we do have our daemon set, or we do have our namespace that we created earlier. And we just deployed two daemon sets on top of it. Um, a daemon set is going to be a, another Kubernetes deployment model that runs a copy of your pod on every Kubernetes host that matches the requirements. Um, I do have two daemon sets because I you um, cannot issue the same. You cannot run the same container on Windows and Linux. Um, they are two fundamentally different. So my chart will actually install one uh, Debian version of the of the Fluentd container and one uh, server core version of it. And we can see that it is off that it is starting to ship its logs in. If we run Insomnia, we should be able to see. Or if we run a get against the indexes, we should be able to see that new index has been created. Or it'll time out eventually. Hmm. We are yellow again. I believe it's because we have a new our new index that has at least one unassigned shard. So this will just take it a few moments to get to back to green. By the way, just quick question. I noticed you were using two master nodes. Do you not? Do you like using? Uh, why? Why have? Uh, do, do you intend on using data nodes as well too, and ingestion nodes? Sorry, one moment. My six-year-old wanted to come and ask me something. Uh, yeah, uh, I am running. I, I am running two master nodes in this deployment model because of the size of my cluster. Right. Um, if you, or it is useful to run your ingest nodes if you're going to be if you expect to be ingesting a large amount of data. Right. Uh, the master nodes themselves basically can function as every type of node. Um, yep. 
The other, and then another good reason to use data nodes, and I do use that in my production environment as well, is if you have different classes of backend storage. Gotcha. Um, for instance, you might be able to use, or there are converters that will convert blob to a file system mount, and that would be great for your old indexes that you're not going to query that much so that it can store it on, you know, cheap object-based storage. Yep. And then you can, you know, use your Azure file premium or your SSDs out for the, for your net, or for your primary nodes. Yep. Makes sense. Sorry about that. But master nodes are able to pretty much play every role. So that is the reason that I am currently using those. Okay. We can see that we now have a new index inside of our cluster um, that is labeled as the index name that we passed in, dev DMZ East US logs, followed up by the date timestamp of today. Um, that's just based on my index lifecycle management. Uh, I tell it to keep my hot nodes hot for one day. And that was configured inside of my charts as well. Okay. Um, the next thing that we were looking at is we wanted to make sure that we picked up all of our all of our um, telemetry data off of our nodes as well. And this one, I've got a couple of caveats on. Um, I originally implemented this out the gate with metric beat. Um, metric beat plays fantastic, or can, does an awful lot of things fantastically. Um, it can sit, it runs as a daemon set on top of your Kubernetes hosts. For your Linux nodes, it does watch things inside of your varprec file system, which gives you massive amounts of insight onto how every container is working. Um, you get very you get much more limited data coming off of your Windows Windows nodes. That's just because of the nature of Windows not liking liking to be open and clear about everything. Um, it is Java based. It it is very well supported. There's great documents out there. Um, but if I were to turn around and rebuild this entire stack as of today, I would replace metric B with Prometheus and store Prometheus and store my Prometheus metrics after two days or inside of Elasticsearch. A um, couple of reasons for that. Um, I don't know if anybody's played with. Uh, uh, horizontal pod auto scaling. Um, if you need to be able to use some type of metric to know that your pods are busy that is not immediately available off of cube state metrics, the one that is most well supported and the only one that is well documented is, is Prometheus. So if I were, like I was saying, if I were to rebuild this entire stack today, I would get rid of metric bid and I would build it with Prometheus for those reasons. Um, when we started this project out, we did not have a requirement around horizontal pod auto scaling, and I and Prometheus had a larger install footprint than Metric Beat for the install. So, um, at the end of the day, they do play similar roles. They both watch for data coming in off of your cube state metrics. They can both watch or can both scrape. Uh, metrics data off of your pods um, from adjacent base you know, Prometheus scrape endpoint, those types of things. But that is that is the one that I had originally worked into here. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and create a namespace called metric B. And we're going to go ahead and deploy the statement set as well. Um, minus n for metric for namespace metric beat install metric beat um, from that church directory that I downloaded from their public repo, and then I'm going to pass in the overrides file. And the overrides file for this one um, is is fairly well modified from what is provided by Elasticsearch directly. Elasticsearch does not provide a flavor of metric beat that runs natively on Windows. So I did have to write my own. Um, I did extend their existing chart to be able to support that. Um, unfortunately, Windows nodes do not allow you to run as privileged. I'm still trying to find a good way around that. And this, and it just, the only other path things that I'm really passing in is what the index name is going to be. 
and where that Elasticsearch index goes. And this should not be there. Okay, and you can pass in what the log level should be. How do you decide when to put something in its own namespace or not? It, it would seem to me like metric B would, could kind of go together in the uh, Elasticsearch namespace. So for my production and version of this deployment, I have everything run inside of a singular monitoring data namespace. Okay. Um, I created dedicated namespaces in this case, be, just to make them more clear and to be able for us to be able to see them more clearly when or through the demo. Okay. Um, typically a good point or my personal reference on namespaces is that a namespace is, is kind of like a chapter in a book that should include all the paragraphs that are necessary to make up that chapter. So um, having Elasticsearch and Kibana, or Elasticsearch and Kibana or Grafana and MetricBeat and FluentD all inside of its own namespace would make sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Um, I did download all these containers before. Um, luckily, unfortunately, Windows containers take on average 10 to 15 minutes to download from a container repository. Yay, Windows. <laughs> um, these will take a few moments to become ready, but there we go. And that will go out there and start implementing all of our, our all of the um, metric data that we had talked about earlier. And then, okay. and this might take a few moments to show up. Ah, we must have changed UTC time zones in the last little while. We can see that we have two Elasticsearch log indexes for the 13th and the 14th. Okay. The next thing that we wanted to, or that we needed to do is we needed to have a way to make this data consumable. Having it all inside of a time series database is fantastic. Um, you, we do have custom APIs available off of our Elasticsearch that allows people to run different queries against it to find data and et cetera. But um, at the end of the day, not our executives and higher and higher ranking people inside of organizations love to see everything displayed in a highly consumable, easy to read format. Um, it also makes it very easy for operations and dev teams to know the current status of all of their um, deployments if they have it you know, set up on a giant screen somewhere where they can see. Uh, we did look at a couple of different or a couple of different solutions for this. There was chronograph. The ones that we looked at were chronograph, Kibana, and Grafana. Kibana is a fantastic product, and they do offer a ton of different and they do offer a ton of different support for it. However, um, under their free and open licensing, you the only user accounts that it support is local user accounts. You're not able to tie it back into an OAuth application. You're not able to tie it into Active Directory or any of those types of things unless you pay for their um, enterprise grade licensing. So that was one of the big reasons that we chose not to follow them. Um, additionally, I have personally found um, building out dashboards in Grafana is much faster and much easier for me. So. We're going, so for this deployment, we're going to go ahead and create a namespace for Grafana. And I do have the Grafana chart already downloaded. Um, this is the one off of the Bitnami website rather than Grafana. Uh, no, sorry. This one is the one off of Grafana's GitHub. It's their community Helm charts. They do also offer, offer an operator, which is a fantastic solution or a fantastic implementation of it as well. If you have multiple teams that are you that need to have their own Grafana dashboards, it makes it very quick and easy to spin those up so that each team would have its own unique instance of Grafana. Um, I am passing in a couple of things with this. I'm passing in, you know, which, which Grafana um, Docker container I wanted to pull. Uh, I'm passing in, um, a number of configuration for it. We're passing in the in or the ingress for it, et cetera. 
uh, and it does have a very small persistent volume claim underneath it as well. And then one thing that I did extend on top of this is that I um, added GitSync as a, as a sidecar. Um, and that just runs, uh, it runs a Git pull every five minutes and pulls down data from a Git repository and lays it down as a, lays it down inside of a folder that is shared out as a persistent volume claim. The purpose for that is to pull down configuration files and pull down my dashboards so that any team that wants to be able to build out a dashboard or change a, you know, an alert target can quickly do that, send me a pull or send a pull request through their team and have that available to them. Um, so I'll show that in, as well in just a moment. I'll go ahead and do a Helm minus N for namespace Grafana, install Grafana, that chart name and that override file that we were just talking about. Did I not tear this? Well, that's not very smart of me. Um, I just ran the Helm chart from metric B. Sorry, one moment. We'll go ahead and uninstall that and change to the correct directory. By the way, this is a great demo so far. I started to ask so many questions, but I noticed uh, you've been running a lot of Helm commands independently. Is uh, I mean, for a demo sake, that's good, but do you yeah. believe in the concept of uh, umbrella Helm chart where you have one Helm chart and sub Helm charts, which is a, which are dependencies? Uh, yes, and I have implemented that in a couple of different places. Um, however, we want to be, or one of our requirements for my deployments in this, when we wrote it for my production instances, is we wanted to be able to stand up the entire cluster off of a singular command. So we took all of these individual Helm charts and we actually wrapped them inside of Ansible. So <laughs> gotcha. We run an Ansible playbook or Ansible playbook and then run that playbook that'll actually build out our entire cluster, it'll build out the AKS cluster from Azure and then lay down all of our operating charts that we need to be able to run that environment. Um, we used Ansible because we were told that we there might be other people that would need to come in that are not necessarily familiar with Kubernetes that might need to also do that. And Ansible seems like it's been around forever um, and has a very easy to learn, uh, easy to start uh, learning curve. We also highly considered uh, a Terraform. Um, and I think the Terraform would have handled a lot of these things a little bit cleaner than Ansible did at the end of the day. But again, our, our goal was to make sure that anybody who comes in and needs to write a helm, needs to write a deployment model has a ton of resources online. Makes sense. Thank you. So, okay, uh, there we go. Um, we do you have our deployment that has come up for Grafana. If we look inside of Grafana, we'll see that there's a couple of different containers that want that ran. We've got two Git sync containers that ran. One is my provisioner container. Um, this one will pull down everything that is inside of the Grafana config repo. Um, this one has uh, basically telling Grafana where the dashboards live, uh, what its data sources are going to be, um, what its what the notifiers are, and that that's used for alerting, so to know how to send things out to pager duty, uh, team, Slack, whatever, and then any plugins that it needs as well. I, I've stripped a lot of this pretty down or down pretty well. The other Git sync will actually go out there and does runs every five minutes and pulls down everything inside of the Grafana dashboards um, repository, and this is where teams can push their JSON model dashboards into and keep them version controlled so that if Bob comes in and you know screws up somebody's dashboard, it really doesn't matter. And that that allows them to have version control on their dashboards and you know be able to pull them in when they need them. Is that piece a manual step? They they have to push that after they make changes? 
It is. And uh, Grafana is actually fantastic about telling them that they're not allowed to just hit the save button. And I'll actually show you kind of the reasons I decided to do it the way I did in just a moment. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and set up a port for just because I do not have public DNS set up properly to this cluster at the moment. I'm going to port forward into, into Grafana. And Did I not set that up quickly? Now, where's my port for? Ah, I delete, I port ported to the wrong port. Hold on one moment. In our, one of the things that I do really like about Grafana and in my production instances we have set up is you are able to tie this back into any OAuth provider and it will not show this screen. It will show the login screen for whatever your OAuth provider is as the first step. Um, I know that I, I know that Azure offers OAuth. I know that Amazon offers it. GitHub offers it. There's there's literally tons of them out there, and we you or we tie it back into our Azure for it so that it. Um, tied into anybody inside the company that needs to be able to access it. And it allows us to set rules inside of there as well. But for the purposes of this de demo, I did not want to set up OAuth. Okay. Inside of uh, Grafana, we can see that we do have our, um, our indexes that I had set up inside of that config file. Um, it does come in and it has all of this pre-configured for us. But something is not right. And this was working earlier. I know why. So, um, give me one moment. My time zone for Grafana is currently set to Mountain Standard Time, but my Grif my cluster is set is not. So let's go ahead and change that. Try ten fourteen. I think you, you were UTC time when it created. Yeah, I actually can't override it there. I forgot. Give me one moment, and we'll actually do an update here on that. Um, let me go into our Grafana config, and I'm just going to go ahead and statically set that for right now. I think you got two sevens, yeah. I do. I'm actually going to go ahead and do this just a little bit different as well. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and knock over that pod so it'll pull up or so it'll run that new in init it container. Um, unfortunately, setting up data sources is something that has to happen prior to Grafana starting. So
opening one moment. I'm going to go ahead and rapidly spin up uh, one so that I can demo out one of my dashboards. Okay. Um, I did not plan around UTC changing time zones on me in the middle of the night or in the middle of our demo. I apologize for that. I should have set this up so that it would not care about that. Um, I can definitely get that fixed in my code before I get it committed. Okay. Inside of there, we also had a dashboard set up as well. And We're going to go ahead and tell it to use okay. And here is the actually all of the data coming in off of Elasticsearch um, for the data that we were looking at. And this builds out a nice executive summary and tells us the, the current health and status of our, of our cluster, which is currently in warning. Interesting. Okay. Um, the other thing that I did want to show in here is that we are also scraping all of our um, all of our logs coming in off of our environment as well. Um, these are the ones that are being shipped in by Elasticsearch or by Fluent by FluentD, and these are made available to the cluster as well. You are able to review these logs in real time. You're able to see in real time how quickly they are coming into your environment. That is not the one I meant to click. Um, we can see that there are spikes in the data. Um, you can see roughly when I created this cluster, um, et cetera. Uh, you're also able to look at this data um, in a raw format as well. And you're able to see with the Fluent D operator that we are, or the Fluent D data set that we are using, is it wraps all of those logs around with Kubernetes data as well. And you're also able to stream these logs in real time and you're able to perform quite a few different operations with that. Um, with Grafana, it makes it really easy to build out dashboards for this as well. So we can actually build out a dashboard that allows us to um, look at any individual namespaces logs. One moment, let me get the proper format for this one. I had it saved, but then I closed my window. So we can see that you were able to add these different values as um, variables that you're able to use inside of your dashboard now. Um, so
Yeah. Now we have a log panel that you can specify for each for any individual cluster that you wanted or for any individual namespace that you wanted to look at in real time. Uh, you're also able inside of Grafana to rapidly take any of this data and say that you want to have an alert on it. You're able to say, if I ever have no logs coming in, so a count of that is below one, I want it to tell me and send notifications out to, in this case, you're able to configure it with MS Teams, Slack. Uh, I know that there is a plugin for ServiceNow, um, email, uh, pager duty, or a bunch of different solutions as well. So that you're able to actively keep track of all of your logs from there. So this is kind of the stack that I've been working on. Um, and I kind of skipped some of these slides, I apologize. A couple of things that I do want to talk about that I've done in my production environment that I thought was outside the scape of this call, um, especially for considering time. Elasticsearch has a tool called Heartbeats. This allows you to add annotations to your pod that tell Heartbeat how to run synthetics against any given pod. So you can actually you know, get real-time Heartbeat information, not only against the pod itself, but you know, any external source that that pod depends on. Um, again, also, Elasticsearch does support open the Open Tracing Initiative. So if you implement Jaeger or Zipkin, Elasticsearch is a fantastic backend for that. And then um, I did want to do a plug for the or for the open source project called GoAlert. Um, when I started this position, or when I started with Bentley, they had no on-call solution. Um, if they needed to engage an engineer after hours, they went to somebody who worked in the NOC who had an Excel document that had said who was on call and what the appropriate phone number was, and they called that person. Um, my previous company used PagerDuty extensively, but when I went to get a quote for them for, for Bentley, I was quoted somewhere around in, in the neighborhood of $200,000 a year. Um, GoAlert is a fantastic open source alternative to it that was released by the target team. And it pretty much has every feature that PagerDuty has, um, but, I, but it is in the open source space and they do encourage people to you know, contribute back to their project. So um, questions, comments, concerns, is there something that I didn't talk about that you would like to have, um, et cetera? You didn't mention um, log aggregation or log searching. Um, one thing that Kibana has been awesome for us for is finding production issues really fast. Yes. So um, I do use Grafana and you are able to do searching in logs on Grafana as well. Um, it does fully support out the, it does allow you to pass in any loosened query just the same as you would inside of Kibana. Okay. Um, I, I really like the way that Kibana implements it, but their requirements around log, around user accounts kind of made it a non-starter for me. Mm -hmm. But you do have the same functionality here as well. And the nice thing, and then along with, I know that Kibana supports it as well, is that if you have something that you know is going to say, always cause you an issue, you are able to build out um, alerts on that in real time. Oh, okay. So that you're able to say, if I, if, if my database starts throwing Java queries, I want I want it to be seen in my logs, and I want it to page me now. So, oh. thanks. Yep. Uh, anything else? So you you talked about uh, let's see metrics and logs both going to Elastic. We uh, were doing that at Motorola. We're still doing that. And the volume of metrics has been overwhelming, uh, oh, making yeah. it so that the logs aren't getting there in time. And so we're switching to uh, be sending metrics to Prometheus and then using Grafana as our dashboarding. Uh, yes. Continuing to lo use logs and Kibana, uh, sorry, use Elastic and Kibana for logs. Any thoughts about that? Um, as I stated earlier, I. 
if I were to rebuild my entire stack today, I would scrape, I would scrape out metric feed and I would replace it with Prometheus. Okay. Um, I would yeah. ship my logs from Prometheus into Elasticsearch so that I, or sorry, scrape my, ship my metrics from Prometheus into Elasticsearch so that I have them beyond the lifecycle management that Prometheus offers because theirs is relatively short. They, they like them to be short lived things. But um, as somebody who spent three months trying to find the leak or trying to find why something was very slow six months ago, because I was told that if I don't, it cost my company a million dollars. I like keeping things around for very long times. Yeah. And yeah, being able to ingest that into Elasticsearch and keep it there using those lifecycle management policies is fantastic. Then if you go through Prometheus first, it changes the, it allows you to do better compression and get it into Elasticsearch much cleaner. Um, additionally, uh, if you are running into ingest issues with Elasticsearch, um, I don't know what your logging agent front end is, but I, I, I would look at using Kibana, or sorry, not Kibana, Kafka in front of Elasticsearch to, to flatten some of those spikes out. Yeah, we're using Azure Event Hub. Uh, as, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm using that extensively as well. Uh, unfortunately, that's the only way I found to be able to get Azure SQL logs back. <laughs> but yeah, if you or Kafka, um, if you are ingesting massive amounts of logs and you need to be able to, you know, feather them into Elasticsearch in a predictable pattern so you don't have spikes all over the place, it does a fantastic job on that. I know that Logs.io, that that's what their front end is right behind their API. So. Awesome. I'll echo the comment earlier uh, that I think your demo was really well put together. Some of these can be tedious and you had it all laid out really nicely. Yeah, right up until I got to playing with Grafana dashboards that just weren't loading, right? <laughs> That's okay. It was a pretty, <laughs> yeah. You still have it was extensive. Well. You were bound to run into, into something like that. Yeah, I, I, I tried to run through it about two hours ago and I ran into no issues, but UTC time zones, man. <laughs> so you handled it like a champ well done uh, anything else you guys want to talk about or is there things that you think that I could have handled better for you or things that you wanted to deep dive further into I know it's no, just, we're this meeting's being right recorded right so is there a way to play this back at some point uh, Brett you are doing a recording uh, do you, how do you post those out do you just put them in, in meetup no well we put them on our YouTube channel for uh, okay. DevOps days, I'll, I'll put a I'll I'll put the URL here in the chat. But yeah, I should be able to get that out later tonight. Perfect. I'll thanks. also put the link in the Meetup channel too. Cool. All right. Well, um, I'll go ahead and hand this back over to the moderator for any for any closing items. And I, again, thank you guys for your time. Thank you, Randall. Really appreciate it. It was great. Uh, if anybody has anything else, please speak up now. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and let you go. And and uh, Brett will get those links in the chat, and then we'll get that up on the YouTube channel. Yeah, I'll just put them in the. I'll put them in the meetup, and then uh, uh, and if you just look up for YouTube Solid City DevOps Days, um, we have a whole bunch there. That's where I always post them. All right. So well, thanks, thanks again, everybody. Randall. Yeah, no yeah thanks, thank everyone. Yeah, thank you. Good night. See you. Yep. Cheers.